Tonight, I want to touch on one of the lessons, if by chance, having had the gift of length, I can do two. <laughs> but afterwards, we want to minister to people, because the Lord opened up something to me today about what he wants us to leave here with. And we're going we're gonna to do that. So we want to touch today on the, the gift of prophecy, the office of the prophet, and the spirit of prophecy. That has been major in terms of contention, in terms of arguments, in terms of people's attempts to explain it and, and so on. And most people in their attempt to sideline it have come up with all types of theories. We're going to go straight with what the Bible says about it. So we are looking at the channels of prophecy. What are we going to look at? Right. Now, one of the things I also want you to bear in mind, because I, 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 I was a teacher for the, the first part of my life, I do ministry in church like if I'm teaching. Therefore, I'll ask you to repeat things. Because one of the things that they taught us in training college is this, that repetition reinforces what you want to learn. Amen. But not only that, let me tell you what, what else I've discovered. I've discovered that when you hear yourself say something, you are more convinced than if somebody else is saying it. <laughs> and may I, may I also tell you, that's why gossipers and, and slanderers and whatever else you want to call them, actually, they actually go out expecting that you will repeat what they've been saying. People learn how to defeat you using your own voice. Oh, yeah. So you meet somebody and the, and the person tells you, and if it's somebody significant to you, the person tells you, I find you so stupid. Eh? You're so dotish. You know, they don't have to say another word. From that moment, you're walking down the road. Oh, she can say, I stupid boy. I stupid her. I stupid her. She can say, I stupid boy. I strip it her, and I take that by me even tell she not my strip it by hey, but you're real strip it up. You notice she never said it again. You notice from then on is you convincing yourself. Because the one voice you have heard more often than any other voice since you were born is your voice. Even when you didn't know the language that your mommy would respond to, you kept on speaking to her, using, of course, a tone that would irritate her and make her get up. But after a while, she learned there's a cry for when you're hungry. Ah! But there's a cry when the diaper wet. Ah! 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 Mm -hmm. And you are convinced at that time in the crib that she heard you. She shouldn't be confused. I know what I'm saying. I need my diaper change. And from there until now, it's your voice that really crosses the threshold to convince you to do anything. Even God, in his wisdom, has learned how to channel what he wants you to do through your voice. Are you, are you hearing me? And that is why it's important to understand uh, 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 that, that when... Uh, a decision is to be made. There are many different voices that speak to you. You hear many, many voices speaking to you. But the one that will convince you is your voice being used by God. Because you, we, re, we usually respond to what is familiar. Anything that's unfamiliar, we already reject it. Before we, until we, we analyze it and see its worth, then we receive it. Therefore, when God wants to speak to us, you know how he convinced Elijah to get out of that cave and do what he asked him to do? He, God used all the other voices that he had used before. The voice of nature. He used the voice of fire. He used the voice of the earthquake. But the scripture says, but God was not in it. Go into, in, into um, 1 Kings 19 and you'll see it. And then, and then a still small voice that was in his thoughts 
God convinced Elijah to get out of that melancholy spirit by what? Speaking to him through his own voice. And I want you to, to, to learn how to culture your voice so as when it speaks to you, it's going to give God the glory and give you a cue that this is what God wants you to do. I, I, are you hearing me? Right, and, and, and that is why we, we quoted that verse last night. Isaiah chapter 50 verse 4. I have the tongue of a learned man. I have the tongue of a disciplined man. Or else, or, or, or I should say, I am exercising MMS, mouth management skills. I have to teach my mouth how to behave itself. Are you hearing me? Uh, we've been saying it at, at Divine Destiny. Not everything that you think you have to say. I say not everything that you think you have to say. I want you to get to that point where you learn how to manage your communication. Especially if you're going to walk in the prophetic. Because once you hook up to the prophetic, your mouth is a very dangerous thing. Because you, something you might just say, I know why, why you run off the road, say you're driving mad, you go run up in a tree. Hello. You might very well meet him down the road in a ditch. And may I also tell you this, that the devil is more prone, more prone to uh, take your negatives and manifest them than it is for the good things you speak to come to pass. Think about it. That's why we, 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 we keep telling people, you have to learn to speak to yourself what you wish other people should tell you. Mm. But you're going to learn that. Yeah, channels of prophecy. Let's, let's look at that. Good. There are three major channels. What are they? The gift of prophecy, the office of the prophet, and the spirit of prophecy. Let's read them again. The gift of prophecy, the office of the prophet, and the spirit of prophecy. What is the gift of prophecy? Let's read Prophecy is one of the nine manifestations of Holy Spirit listed in 1 Corinthians 12.10. 12, 10. Anybody ever read that? 1 Corinthians 12.10? Now, if you understand the book of Corinthians, the, both 1 and 2 Corinthians, you'll realize that Paul is dealing with matters that had arisen in one of his greatest, quote-unquote, churches that he had set up the church at Corinth, but they had run into certain problems and a group of them had come to him uh, while he was in Rome to ask him to give his directions, his counsel on certain matters. And if you read well, you'll realize every time Paul is about to uh, deal with a certain category of questions, he will say, no concerning so-and-so, no concerning so-and-so. So when you get in the first Corinthians chapter 12, he says, no concerning the gifts of the Spirit. So you know from chapter 12 until he goes, no concerning so-and-so again, he is going to be dealing with all the, 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 the gifts of the Spirit that were uh, operating in the church at Corinth. And he came to the point where he was talking about the, the gifts of the Spirit, the nine gifts of the Spirit. And uh, 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 find them for me. Find, find 1 Corinthians 12. Because some people, some people watching me, that in the Bible, boy? That in the Bible? Yes, it's in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 10 for me. Would I say 10? No, 12. 1 First, First Corinthians 12. 12. Uh, we had to go to 12, 12, 1 before we get to 12, 10. First Corinthians. Um, if, if, if somewhere down by Psalms, you're in the wrong neighborhood. You need to move up. Move across to the right. Keep moving. Keep moving until you see C-O-R-I-N. Or oh, go in the table of contents, man. Hey. Very anointed page in the Bible. All the books are right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the anointings. Right. So, so, so look, at, look at verse 1. It, 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 um, it corroborates what I was saying as far as the, the, the category of um, discussion that Paul is getting into. So let's read verse 12, uh, verse 1 of chapter 12, King James Version. Let's read. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. 
Remember what we said last night? What did we say last night? The first thing God had to remove off the earth was the spirit of darkness. Darkness is akin to ignorance. When you do not know, you are in the dark. And when you, when you are in the dark, then it means that you are blind concerning any matter. Which means that anybody, as we used to say when you were small, uh, 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 in the world of the blind, a one-eyed man is king. I'll say it again. In the world of the blind, a one-eyed man is king. Why? Because everybody else depends on him. And not just depends on him, but if he's devious, he could lead everybody else down a ditch. Huh? And that's what has been happening in the church for years. People who are ignorant of what they're teaching have been teaching people, and we've ended up powerless. We, we've ended up with less than the kind of, 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 of success we are supposed to have. But, and that is why it's not just the apostle and the prophets that have returned. The teacher has also returned. There was a point where the church was sp uh, uh, specializing only in pastoral and evangelistic anointing. But now God has restored the prophet and the apostle because the prophet and apostle are basically teachers. That's what Paul did. Or every one of his epistles is a lesson in how to teach and train people. Are we understanding that? And, 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 and that is why I, I, I like to listen to people categorize preachers that they meet, see on TV and so on. And I, I hear a lot of people give this guy real, real queer mouth, as we say in Trinidad. What's his name? Joel Osteen. Oh, oh, he's only, uh, he's only give motivational speech. But hey, I wish if giving motiv motivational speech could bring 19,000 people to sit before me twice on a Sunday. Oh, pshua, hey. Hmm. That's his anointing. Yes. Don't knock a man for his anointing if, it's, if he's succeeding with it. You see about what? About fine-tuning yours. Yes. So, so, so if, if motivational speaking brings 19,000 people to me, hey, just leave me, let me motivate. Yes. Well, it's the same thing with, with the teacher. Paul comes and says, you are ignorant. Darkness covers your mind, so you are bungling. You are making missteps. Anybody know, you ever heard that word in Trinidad recently? You are making missteps, so you need for me to enlighten you. So he, so he says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I will not have you ignorant. And he comes on until he gets down to verse 4. He says, let's read verse 4. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the... Absolutely important to know that the same Holy Spirit who, are, who gives and administers all the gifts, he is inside of all of us. Which tells me that everybody has the potential to blossom out in whatever Holy Spirit does. It just happened that some people are more trusting and yielding to Holy Spirit in certain areas. So you will see a person being more prophetic than another person. But that don't make the person better. Right. It just makes the person more responsible for that gift. Huh? So, so it's very possible that in, in, in Ephesians 4.11 where it says that, that he gave apostles, some prophets, some uh, evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. It's possible that one person could stand with Holy Spirit in him and exhibit to the highest level of excellence and impact all those gifts. Well, 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 that's how Jesus was. Jesus was the embodiment of all the streams of anointing. And he was therefore the embodiment of all the offices that would administer those gifts. That's why when he ascended, he had the right to distribute those gifts to everyone that is willing to flow in it. Are you, are you hearing me? I really want us to, to catch that because uh, sometimes we are in such awe. Such awe. Oh, that's Apostle Vivian Duncan. He's an awesome prophet. Yeah. Oh. Oh. I, 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 I was in, in uh, Barbados recently ministering, and a sister finally mustered up enough courage to come and speak to me. And yeah, yeah. When I saw you moving the gifts like that, I got so scared. <gasps> scared. So I said, so, well, what's, 
What's the problem? But the, the thing is, and you're actually speaking to me. Oh. <laughs> May I tell you, prophets, prophets have toilet in the house. And as soon as you finish eat, if you don't have a good system, you better get some broclax to fix it. Profit or no profit. And in our house, we have one, two, three, one, two, three, four, four toilets. So it, 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 it's in, 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 in a, an appropriate location in case you get it wherever you are. A prophet, prophet normal. Tell your neighbor, prophet normal. normal. Apostle normal. Hey, we normal. We are, we are normal people. And I want you to always remember that because the same Holy Spirit in me is in you. So you don't get hoodwinked by people. who he has such an awesome spirit. Yes, it's the same one inside of you. You need to yield to him. Come give God some praise for being such an awesome God. Ah, ah Hallelujah. Uh, I, I, I look say, so there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are differences of what? Administration, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it's the same God which worketh all in all. I really want us to catch that. Don't let anybody tie up your brain. Because they've been all around the world. And because they can tell you what your telephone number is. Why are you so awed by somebody who tells you your telephone number and you knew it all the time? <laughs> and why weren't you awed by yourself? Oh, he knows my telephone number. I know mine too. <laughs> hmm. Look at this. For to one is given by the Spirit, given by the? Spirit. Given by the? And notice capital S, so it's Holy Spirit, not your spirit. The word of? Wisdom to another, the word of knowledge by the same spirit. And Paul seems to be reiterating it's the same Holy Spirit. That's the unifying force that should have the church together. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy to another discerning of spirits to another diverse kinds of tongues to another the interpretation of tongues but let's read verse 12 loudly but all these work at that one and the self same spirit dividing to every man severally as he Wills. And I really wanted to bear that in mind because a lot of people have gotten all, all, all messed up by, by saying because it's to another gift of prophecy, to another healing, to another so and so and another so and so and another so. It means that nobody could carry more than one of them. Uh -uh. If you go back and read, you read verse 11, verse 11 clinches the whole mechanics of how the things work. How, what does he say? He gives us severally. To all as he wills. So it means one person could have several gifts. In fact, I dare say to you, if Holy Spirit is the Spirit, and since Holy Spirit is the driving force and the administrator of the gifts of the Spirit, if he is in you, and since he is in you, it means that you have the potential at any point in time to exhibit all of them. And if you, if you uh, practice them, if you practice them, then you can stand at any point in time and exhibit all those gifts. In fact, I dare say, when we stand to minister now, uh, all the gifts show up. Prophecy, healing, tongues, interpretation of tongues. Why? Because it's the same Holy Spirit. Lift your right hand up. I want to speak into your spirit that you develop a, a greater and more healthy relationship with Holy Spirit because he is, he is the voice of God in the earth. He is the representation of the Godhead in the earth. Father, I prophesy over each of us even as we, stand, we sit before you and we are lifting up our hands, those upstairs, those downstairs, and those who may get this DVD at some point in time. We prophesy over each one 
that we develop an even greater affinity with Holy Spirit. That we actually get to the point where when we are reading the word, we say, Holy Spirit, I'm about to read. Please reveal to me what the Father wants. Holy Spirit, we are about to do worship rehearsal. Please tell us what song the Father would want to hear on Sunday. Holy Spirit, we are about to go to that house meeting. What are the contending spirits we'll have to deal with? Cause us, Lord, even when we're going to work, Holy Spirit, which road should I take today to avoid all the mess up and the mix up and all the jam? Holy Spirit, I decree that you will cause someone to move out that car park as soon as I am lined up so I don't have to drive around looking for a car park today. Lord, let us re rise to that level, Lord, where we begin to give Holy Spirit greater significance in our lives in the name of jesus take us beyond the tongues lord take us beyond the tongues take us beyond the dance take us beyond the dancing around take us beyond doing a helicopter take us beyond that lord to the place where we are guided truly by holy spirit somebody say lord i receive it, lord, I, receive it. I shall walk in it, I shall walk in, it. in the name of jesus good jesus. right so we continue Let's, so, so remember it's Holy Spirit who administers the gifts. So the, the, therefore the gift of prophecy is one of the nine manifestations as we saw there. Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 7 that it is what? Given. It is what? Given to everyone by the Spirit. It's given to everyone. Therefore, therefore, therefore you can't come and really ask me or expect me to pass on the prophetic gift to you. Because it is not mine to give or take. Huh? I say it is not mine to give or take. Because what I have is what he gave me. Therefore my job is to carry out a responsibility that says what? Now that you have received it and you are operating in it, you are now uh, designated as a coach or a mentor. To first of all let everybody know that that person has it in him and also help that person to develop it to the highest level of efficiency. Are you, are, are you understanding that? In fact, what the Lord really expects, just like with, with, with Elijah and Elisha, Elijah coaches Elisha, but when Elijah goes up, Elisha takes a double portion. But beyond that, may I tell you, beyond that, and, and we'll talk about that when we do the, the, the full course, we, we say the ultimate, the ultimate responsibility of a mentor in the church, in the body of Christ, in the kingdom, is not only to give that person your spirit. Because may I tell you, whichever leader you are following, you won't catch that person's spirit. That's why you cannot be following a leader and you're rebellious against that leader. Because if you are following a person and you have not caught that person's spirit, you cannot help that person develop the vision. Mm. There's, a, there's a whole series that I have. I have not even done it with um, Divine Destiny yet. I, I did it with another set of churches uh, as I traveled called Do You Know Your Assignment? And may I tell you, your first assignment is not to the church. Your first assignment is to the leader. Your first assignment is to your leader, then to the vision of that leader, then to the ministry within which he is fleshing out the vision. That's why so many people are walking into churches but never hooking up with the leader. And because of that, you cannot be fulfilled. Because if you go right through scripture, you'll notice God sent Elijah to find Elisha. Notice Jesus went on by the beach and he didn't start a church. He first drew people to him. After that, he asked them, who am I to you? And because Peter was able to find out who he was to them, he says, now I build my church. Mm. And that's when you sit in defiance in, in, in the pew, sit in defiance in the congregation against your leader, you're shooting yourself in your foot. And there are some people who actually tell you straight up, I don't, I, I, I don't want nobody to lead me. 
I, I just go to church because I know the scripture says forsake not the assembling of yourselves. Well, you in a re, you in a real monkey pants. In fact, I think you have on two monkey pants at the same time. And let me tell you why you have on two monkey pants at the same time. First, the first monkey pants you have is that you don't belong nowhere. That's right, you're homeless. And the second one is that you're headless. <laughs> Has anybody uh, grown, grown up in the, in the, in the, um, in the country and mommy asked you to kill the fowl? Uh, when you cut that neck of the chicken, you better be sitting down on that bucket. You, know? yes. Yes, yes. you don't cut the neck of a chicken and just leave it there. Hello, the whole yard will get bloody. And that's what happened with the church. A lot of bloody people, oh, a lot of people blooding up the church. <laughs> Blooding up the church because they're headless. Are you hearing me? But you know what I found out, Bishop? You know what I found out? You know why a lot of people cannot follow a leader? Their first level leader, Daddy, didn't do a good job. And that's why the church needs deliverance because most of the people who are in rebellion in the church never had a father who disciplined them. You see, Mommy could do it. Two, but the main disciplinarian of the church, of the, of the child, of the family, is supposed to be the father. That's, therefore, when the father is not functioning, that child becomes headless. Until such time, that child comes to understand that even if my physical daddy wasn't there, I have a daddy in heaven. But therein lies the problem. Lots of people who did not have a father to raise them uh, by him being present and dysfunctional or absent and couldn't function anyway have great problems saying the Our Father prayer. Because in their mind, a father that who didn't raise them is not a good person, an example. So when I say, our oh, father, we put God in the same category. And that's why the church needs a lot of deliverance. Because rebellion comes out of not having been fathered properly. That's why we tell people who come for premarital counseling, you need to deal with the matter concerning your father. If you're a man, you need to deal with that matter. If you and your father want in, 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 in a good cordial relationship or you never saw your father or your father never uh, raised you, then you're going to have a problem, first of all, raising your own children. Because it's not enough to get your wife pregnant. You also have to stick around to raise the children. Yes. And that's why a lot of guys have problems fathering because their daddy didn't stick around. Did I say dust of the Lord? Dust of the Lord, that's prophecy. And I'm a stickler to that because another series we do as we travel is, is, is inner healing through the power of forgiveness. You cannot really come to the fullness of your potential in the earth until you have forgiven, first of all, your father. Your first level leader is supposed to be your father. And, and, and I'm also going to drop this. Do you know, fellas, do you know that if your wife didn't have a father, do you know that part of your husbanding has to be fathering as well? So the, the fact that he gives it to everyone, it means that it's a gift, an unmerited divine bestowment upon a person. You can't work for it. You don't work for a gift. Hello, you don't work for a gift. And if you have to ask for it, it's not a gift, it's a present. But at the same time, fellas, I want you to bear in mind, I have <coughs> I've learned over 38 years, and four years before that, so that's 42, <laughs> while courting and so on. Guys, please, three things thou shalt not forget. <laughs> One, your wife's birthday. Forget yours, but please. 
to your anniversary. And three, Mother's Day. Listen, whether she has child or not, Mother's Day. I'm just trying to help you out. And please, don't ask her what gift you want. You are supposed to be like Adam, creative. Supposed to know what God is saying. Please. But I could advise you all year long, hint, hint, hint. If you listen well, mm. let's move on, let's move on, let's move on to the next one. Ah, uh, Jesus. Hallelujah. The gift of prophecy. Notice I'm looking up, not down. Look up, your redemption. Draw it now. <laughs> Look at this. It is not given on the basis of Christian maturity, but because Christ wants to what? Bless his church through it. In other words, in other words, not because I'm in church for the last 40 years, it means that I am automatically proficient in any gift. Are you hearing me? Years spent in church do not automatically translate into maturity. Because maturity comes out of yielding and submitting to God. So somebody who will come in within a year could be far advanced than a person who's been there for 10 years, refusing to yield and submit. Are you hearing me? So don't, don't let the years spent in a particular arena make you think that that person is ready. In fact, right now, the book I'm hustling to finish uh, is, is, is uh, Common Mistakes That Men Make. And one of them is this, to grow old but never grow up. All right. All right. To grow old but never grow up. Do you, know, do you know Paul had to make himself grow up? In the very next chapter there, um, 1 Corinthians 13, he says, when I was a child, I speak as a child, I thought as a child, I understood as a child. Those three processes represent really the whole mechanics of what makes you you. He said, but when I became a man, I what? Put, I what? They didn't just leave me. He said, I had to deliberately take an action to put it away. Because to have childishness in a mature male is to have disaster waiting to happen. Are you hearing me? No, no, no. Notice there's a big difference between childlikeness and childishness. In fact, Jesus actually told his disciples, if you don't become childlike or like this child, then you will never make it into the kingdom. But of course, he would deal with them when they were exhibiting childishness, which was murmuring and who better than who and who should be, who should be the leader. And who. He said, get out of that for me, please. He said, all of you who want to be on top, get down and serve. But the greatest among you is the one that will serve everybody else. You see, that's why a lot of people sit in the, in the, in the congregation and they say, boy, if I was pastor, hello, get that out of your vocabulary. You don't want to be pastor. Here's the next one. Let's read. Practice of the gift is based on the level of the individual's faith. You read Romans chapter 12, verse 10. I am not a better prophet than you, or you are not a better prophet than me, as the case may be. It all depends, as I just said, on my yielding. How much do I yield to God? Because there are times, I'm telling you, look, I, 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 you were here last night. Those who were here last night. Wasn't God awesome in the house last night? Oh, Jesus. Now, how did, that, how did that come about? I had to yield to Holy Spirit. I knew what I had to teach, but Holy Spirit told me nobody could really walk in the awesomeness of the prophetic until they learn how to speak in tongues. So we had to give a big slice of the teaching to dealing with tongues. And look what that did. Huh? I could say, well, I, I have my notes here. I have it here already. Uh, Holy Spirit, take aside. Take aside. I had to teach. I had to teach. 
That's <laughs> that ever happened to you. You come with your um, you come with your notes and thing, and it loose, and suddenly like a wind come and just blow away everything, and it mix up, and it, it's supposed to be page one, page two, page three, page four, and you didn't have your glasses, and next thing you know, you start with page four. You say, nah, but that's how you take a page three. <laughs> you know what Holy Spirit was telling you? Get rid of the notes. I gonna speak to you out of your heart, and you deliver what the people want. No, you cannot come like that all the time either because it's a study to show yourself approved. So you have to have balance. Tell your neighbor it's about balance. Tell your neighbor you're an eagle. You're an eagle. Eagles live on a principle of what? Balance. The strongest wind could come. It could never topple an eagle because he knows how to shift its weight. Shift its weight until it stabilizes. Isn't that awesome? And that is, that is why you, got, you don't try to copy anybody else. I see some short, some short skinny people trying to play TD Jakes. God, sir. God, first thing you have to be six foot five and you have to be an archbishop. Yeah, you understand? You, you have to, no! Tell your neighbor the best you can be is you. And the best you can be of anybody else is a copy. And that's why I'm so glad Holy Spirit comes to me, comes to you as individuals, and he gives each of us the gift the way he wants us to deliver it. Yes. Are you hearing me? Yes. Good, good. So we, we, we continue. The child of God should seek to prophesy more than he seeks after any other gift. When you get into chapter 14, Paul begins to, to uh, uh, kind of streamline to the Corinthians what they should really be going after. He said, in chapter 12, he said, these are the gifts. In chapter 14, he says, here what? Of all those gifts, if you're going to choose anyone, choose to prophesy. Huh? He said, choose to what? But may I show you something? I call it literary engineering. Do you realize that between 12 and 14, there is 13? I said, between 12 and 14, there is? <laughs> between 12 and 14, there is 13. Big revelation, thus said the Lord. Ah! Huh? Is that important? Yes, because what separates the, 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 the list of gifts from the exercising of the gifts is the love. I want to hear me. It's the love. If you do not have the love of God, then shut up because you're going to hurt people with your gifts. And I hope I get into this next part there because, because I, the, 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 the next chapter talks about, about the, the, the responsibility of the prophet. You don't walk around with this gift like a wand to either give licks or to pull uh, out stuff out of people. It's the grace of God that you are walking in it. Uh, some people just strut. Uh -huh, I'm a prophet. And some people think, once you have it, you're supposed to, oh, shh, oh, shh, ah, It's a normal thing, hello. I say it's normal. Hey, it's normal to have God in you. Do you know that God is in you? In, even before you got saved, you were made in his image and likeness. So when he, the God in you hooks up with the Holy Spirit that comes to live in you, you're supposed to become a more stable person. It doesn't make you of a higher class than anybody else. It makes you more responsible, I'll say it again. Good. Let's continue. Right. Apostle Paul proclaims that he speaks the word of God in at least four different ways. But the most effective of them all is through prophecy. Through prophecy. Now, you've you got to understand then the sense in which he was speaking it. Because he says he speaks in tongues, but if, if somebody needs to find out what he's saying in tongues, when it's a message, it needs to be interpreted. 
right? But um, well, may, may, may I um, help you out here? I know somebody who just began to speak in tongues last night, and, and you go back to your church where you came from, where they don't really believe in tongues and so on, being spoken freely like that, or in your office, instead of talk to other people of somebody from other churches, they're going to tell you straight, it was the interpretation of the tongues. And they will say in the book of Acts, you're supposed to interpret the tongues. Because on the very first day when it happened, uh, um, the fact that they spoke in different tongues and different people were understanding, it means that people had come from all over and they understood the languages that were being spoken. Yes, that's very well and good. If the tongues is about a message. But when the tongues is about worship, which you will use more often than uh, speaking it as a message, you don't need to interpret it to nobody because it's a vertical communication between yourself and God. Therefore, whoever is on your side, standing at the same level with you, don't need to know what you're telling God. Hallelujah. Are you hearing me? I really want you to understand that. And then at any rate, I pointed out last night in Isaiah chapter 28, it says, this is the rest. Where it I'll call the weary, cause the weary to rest, which tells me when you are in a warfare, you're in serious spiritual warfare, and you want to get to the point where all that restlessness and frustration gets out of you, you need to switch to tongues. Because, because tongues is a weapon of war. And when you're using tongues as a weapon of war, nobody next to you needs to know what you're saying. It's only when a prophetic grace comes upon you and God gives you a message in tongues that you are supposed to seek interpretation. And may I tell you, I know this is, this is a controversial point that a lot of people say, if you speak in tongues, then somebody is supposed to interpret. You're not supposed to interpret it. But when the Lord opened it up to me, he says, the same grace that came into you by way of Holy Spirit to, to release tongues, that grace is there in you to interpret it. In, in fact, it's better you interpret it than somebody who had an agenda before anyway and uses your tongues as cover. Oh, yes. You come with a tongue to bless the church. Shanda Raba Kando Robo Shunda Rikande Shanda Rebo Baba Baba Ida Raba No Ida Baba Shanda. And God is saying, I'm going to bless my people. Difficulties you've been having, I'm giving you power and authority over everything that rises up against you. The whole church is supposed to go up in uproar. Up comes somebody who had an agenda. Sin, sin, sin. Repent, repent. There's a lot of sin in the church. Oh God, my belly. God tell me that sin this morning. Oh God, my belly. Lie your pants on fire. That was not what God said. So the people who we, if God has allowed us to train in the prophetic, we tell them straight up, if God is going to give you tongues, ask him for the interpretation. Yes. Okay, next one. Prophecy is one of the gifts that what? Build that what? Build up. Build up. That what? Build up. But how so many churches are breaking up because of it? Simply because the people who are administering it are doing it without the spirit of intelligence. Oh, when we do the full course, you'll re realize this. Many people who I spoke to here last night, I spoke into their spirit over the microphone. But there were some of them who, whose uh, stuff was very intimate and God said to me, don't speak it over the phone. Because I found out something about a prophetic session. There are a lot of people who've been waiting for the last bit of information to lace somebody else. And you hear who say it? It's Apostle Vivian Duncan, you know. He accurate like nothing. So if he says so, then it's so. So God tell me, say so out of the microphone. <laughs> And we usually tell the ushers, just back off a little. Because this is information just for this individual. And not only that, there are things that the Lord says to us. Uh, there's a, call, uh, um, a lesson we do called how to word your prophecy. One of the things the Lord tells us about wording the prophecy is this, that you have to find sometimes some all-inclusive words to cover things like rape and incest and so on. Because you don't want to say that 
in the public. And somebody who didn't like their sister at all finally find out where she come from. Oh, uh -huh. you played it better than me. All right. Mm -mm. Because prophecy is not supposed to cause confusion. Prophecy is supposed to bless God's people. Why? Because a true prophecy comes from the mind of God. And the mind of God is always about empowerment. Somebody say empowerment. Oh. Tell your neighbor God wants to empower you, not to strip you. Not to destroy. Listen to me. By the time a prophecy that strips a person comes, God had warned them years in advance. And he said, no, because you don't want to follow what I told you in private, take a public blessing or, or stripping. Are you hearing me? I want us to catch that. So don't be afraid of prophecy. Be afraid of false prophets. Because one of the lessons we do too is, is, is this, that a false prophet is not one who gives a prophecy that doesn't come to pass necessarily. It's one who has a bad character but want to prophesy. Yes. Because it's about character. Balaam, Balaam had accuracy from the day, from day one. He was so accurate that he got a contract to curse people. <laughs> he got a contract. Uh, it wasn't 34 million, but I don't know how much it was, but he got a lot of money for it. Yeah, he got a lot of money. Mm -hmm. and, and hear what? And hear what? God told him, don't go. But he decided to prostitute the gift. And as he went out prostituting the gift, the scripture actually calls him a diviner. Not a prophet of God, but a diviner. Although he heard from God, God spoke into his spirit. He ended up being categorized as a diviner or an obia man. In Trinidad, he'll be an obia man. Although he was that accurate. I see that's where people, a lot of people run into problems. How, so how come if that person is not of God, how come they're so accurate? How come they knew everything? Listen to me, watch their lifestyle. I say, what's your lifestyle? Is, isn't it something? Sometimes we were in Canada, uh, Pastor Jim and I, and we're driving, coming around this corner, and there are two gypsies, the mother and the daughter, sitting on two buckets, and on the buckets, Mark, come, $2 for your fortune. <laughs> now, if, if, if you know my fortune for $2, how come you're so unfortunate <laughs> to be sitting there? <laughs> you should know your fortune. You understand? And, uh, and supposing you have a, a, a prophecy for me, quote unquote, of God giving me five million, it's only two dollars you got charge me. Something wrong. <laughs> I'm telling you, those are the kind of crazy things that are happening. And many people will get hoodwinked into, into, and sucked into that if you don't know. But that's why God had to remove ignorance first. Amen. Look at this next one. Let, prophesying was a common practice among the assemblies that Paul established. Why? Because Paul himself was a prophet. And whichever anointings are upon your leader, those will be the accent gifts in the church. If your leader is a singer, watch how many people in that church become singers. One of the anointings upon us is, is writing. And at, at Divine Destiny Worship Center, we have a lot of authors emerging. In fact, we actually do our own, uh, um, we call it devotional, every quarter. And in every devotional, we have three people who took the time and wrote 31 devotions for a month. And we put it together. The writing anointing is upon us, so it's coming upon people. Are you hearing me? The anointing to raise finances, the anointing for wealth is upon us. So a lot of people in the house who came in poor have broken the spirit of poverty. Are you hearing me? That's why it's very important when you get into a ministry to actually ask God to show you the streams of anointing in that ministry and see whether or not you could fit into that. The, the, the prophetic anointing is upon us. So anywhere you sit down in divine destiny, when we say turn to somebody, hold hands, and prophesy, you are sure to get a prophetic word. People have come to see me, and I told them, they call up, and I say, come on a Sunday morning, and then we can talk afterwards and see if we could set a time. And after they came, after the service, they come to me and they say, I don't need to see you again. See that sister in green going down there? 
She read me like a book. <laughs> when you said turn to, to the person next to you and prophesy. And she answered every question I needed to know. Why? Because whatever anointing is on your leader is going to come upon you. And that is why you have to decide that, and in fact, you have to know that you're assigned to your leader and not the church. Because people in the church could get you bumped off from following your leader. But when you know you're assigned to a leader, you are committed to that leader, and it doesn't matter what other people are doing. They can't stop you from following a leader. I know some people say that's, that's cultish behavior, but I have news for you. I, I, the word cult, may, may I tell you the word cult is the, is, is, is the very root of the word cult here? Do you know the word culture is what we, what we, why we eat our food? Agri, culture. Hmm? Hmm? Because anything, anything that has to deal with, with, with a cult, it has to do with cultivating stuff. So isn't it possible then that there, there, there is the good and there's the bad side? So you can't show the baby with the bad water. And immediately, every church has a culture. Read Apostle James' book there that deals with fostering and forging apostolic communities. And you'll find out that there is a culture that is developed in every community of people. Your job has a culture. Huh? Trinidad has a culture. The Caribbean has a wider culture than Trinidad. Hmm? Your family has a culture. In fact, it's better that you develop a culture in, in your family within the walls of the family than the neighbor next door coming to develop a culture from their house into your house. Here is one, the gift of prophecy. Let's read. Now is the time to put the gift of prophecy in its rightful place in the body of Christ. You read First Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 to 5, and then especially verse 20, it says, despise not prophesy. Despise not. The word despise means to reject. He said you cannot afford to reject prophecy. Because if you reject prophecy, you are actually disconnecting yourself from the mind of God. You cannot live in the kingdom of God and not have access to the mind of God. And having had access to the mind of God, you cannot reject the mind of God when he downloads his mind to you. Because that means you are an imposter. In the kingdom. You know the story of the dog, how you, you used to hang with horned animals and one day they say they're going out to do a party out in the sea, deep water sea, deep water party. And he say he had no horn and he really wanted to go. So what he did, he took some cardboard, made a horn and he actually stuck it onto his head and he passed through the metal um, detector. <laughs> and he went on the, on, the, um, on the boat. But here I'm with him. Here yeah, well, I am with him. Dog forgot that his horns were glued on. His horns didn't grow from inside out. His horn came from outside on, not even in. <laughs> and man, they start to boogie out there. Boogie. And, and dog, dog gonna buy bull. Now bull is the guy in charge, but dog wanted to say he could outdance bull. So he really give it because you know he's thin and slim and so on. And dog and, and bull big and heavy. And he boogie and he giving given uh, bull some serious competition. To, and, and he telling bull by his body language, you are you are boo, boo. You're boo, boo. And suddenly <laughs> suddenly sweat took over. Because Bull and, want to know, Bull and all want to know who's this new creature here. But sweat made the difference. <laughs> Boom, the horns fell off. And you know what happened? That's where the word a traitor on board examined the horns came from. And they threw him out in the sea. And that's how dog learned to swim, you know? He had to learn to swim. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Oh, Jesus. Tell anybody more of the story is? If you have glued on horns, don't sweat. Right? Oh, Jesus. 
<laughs> Let's read. Any New Testament church that is functioning on the same foundation that was laid by the apostles and the prophets will have manifestations of the Holy Spirit, especially the prophetic gift. And you know, Ephesians 2.20 says the church is built on the, on the um, foundation of the prophets and so on. Let's read. The gift of prophecy operates within the saints or ministers for the general edification, encouraging, and comforting of the church. When you go into First Corinthians, you'll get all that. And that's why I'm telling you, um, that, no, 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 balance. What did we say is important? Balance. Now, somebody accosted me when we started in the prophetic and so on and, and quoted that verse. And I didn't know how to answer until Holy Spirit opened it up. Do you know when they said it must be general edification, encouraging and comforting, it means that you cannot give a word that will upset people. That's what, that's what people interpret it as. But then the Lord opened up to me. What is the meaning of the word edify? Do you know the word edify means to build? But if you're going to build anything, what is the first thing you have to do with the plot of land that you're going to build it on? You got to what? You got to clean it up. But if there is an already existing structure on it that does not fit into the vision of what the architect has in mind, what do you have to do? Break it down. And that's why a lot of people get really confused when a prophetic word is about changing your behavior. But thought God said, God said, uh, Apostle Duncan, preach, teach how, how it's about um, God blessing you. But do you know the word bless doesn't really mean can, house, and land? Do you know God blessed man when man was spirit? Therefore, could it be house and land? And so it wasn't even invented as yet. How, how of um, Genesis 1.28, and God blessed them. So what does bless mean? It couldn't mean house and car and land and job and money. Huh? Blessed really means empowered. Amen. And God empowered them because God always going to empower you before he gives you a task. That's why when he gives you a task, you can't tell God you can't do it. He has already put the grace in you. What you need to know is how to tap into the grace. Yes. Therefore, therefore, if God says I will empower you, then the first thing God will do is go into your life and see what is your power source. But not only your power source, but what is the limit of your power. Because if it's to empower you, it's going to be for a task that's greater than what you're doing right now. Therefore, like, like, like the house where we live, if myself and Apostle Gemma, we move out and go to, uh, to, to another house and the people who buy it decide to turn it into a factory, do you know they're going to have to change the power system? Because many of the machines that they will have to use will not carry 110. They will have to be industrial type machines, which means the power supply has to be at industrial level. But do you know they cannot run industrial level power in the same circuit and the same tubings like 125 domestic? So the house, if you go into the house, when they are making the change over, you will wonder, how could they destroy a house that was so well set? But there's an aim. What's the aim? Greater empowerment. Yes. Therefore, if God says he's going to edify me, God is going to bring me to a place through the prophetic where he's going to change my circuitry. He's going to change my power supply. He's going to change my range of power. Because what he wants me to do, the present power system I operate by, not going to be adequate. And that is why when you get a prophetic word and you are working towards, uh, or you set yourself to see the manifestations of it, many times God runs you through a shoot that strips you like a plucked chicken. Dip you in hot water again and then singe you over some fire to get rid of your little hairs. And he had done yet, he had to open you up now. Flash. Take out that guts inside you. Eh? But the Lord gave me a word. How come so much trouble coming to my life? Oh God, what have a oh God? What you need to do is yield. Tell your neighbor, yield. Because God not trying to kill you. Well, he really trying to kill you. 
and raise you to the next level, raise the next you inside there. Because the biggest problem in our lives is battling the next me on the inside. In fact, we put it this way, our biggest enemy is our inner me. I'm here to tell you, the biggest enemy against what God wants to do in your life is your inner me. But God, I didn't expect it so. I got so. What makes God God? You know what makes God God? He sees beyond me, he sees beyond you. You know what makes God God? He don't have to get advice from you. Wow. <laughs> Begin next one. We deal with the office of the prophet now. The office of the prophet. Oops. No, so we just dealt with the gift of prophecy. It's for everybody in the church. It's for? Everybody. It's for everybody. Because Holy Spirit lives in you. And Holy Spirit carries all the gifts. And if you yield to him, you're going to prophesy. You're going to raise the dead. You will heal the sick. You will cast out devils. It's part of the gift that God has given and the empowerment system he has given to the church. Somebody give God some praise for that. Hallelujah. I say give God some praise for that. Hallelujah. Woo! That you can rise up one morning, watch your son, I mean rolling on that bed because of asthma, and lay hands on him, and decree by God's authority the spirit of asthma out. And you got to go. Afterwards you call the pastor and tell him what you do. Because if you call the pastor at 2 o'clock in the morning, he ain't coming. <laughs> right? At that time, he hugging. <laughs> and your son might not survive until 8 o'clock when he released the embrace. So between 2 and 8, you better know how to activate Holy Spirit who lives in you and at least like a paramedic who goes to the, to the accident on the street corner stabilize your son until you, the doctor shows up because the, the paramedics can't do um, surgery there they stabilize and they bring you safely to the bay in the, in the emergency but may I tell you, that's the kind of anointing that's upon the church, Amen. upon the saints. In fact, may I tell you, as the saints actually learn how to mobilize and activate what they have, they will begin to become more proficient in it to the point now that a, a, a leader could actually send out the saints and say, you go, I can't make it, I have to travel, but there are three homes that need a visit in the next two weeks. I'm sending this squad here, I'm sending that squad there. And when you go there, you go there under the same mantle of of the leader that's upon you that's that, that you are following I do you understand that oh my god and Holy Spirit actually makes your leader look good through the anointing that will function in you are you understand that but but may I tell you hello may I tell you when you go there and the people get healed no come and testify oh God was so good to me I tell you when we began to pray I mean somebody whispered in my ears that brother John did come and nothing happened but when I stood up a piece of anointing hit me and I feel it from the left and the right and I get up <laughs> may I tell you you were able to go in that house because he sent you I say people who are leaders in churches and want to lord it over people. Do you know that you are leading just because your leader delegated the authority to you? Yes. Do you know if he didn't, didn't approve of you, you couldn't stand by the door and tell me where to sit down? Yes. <laughs> the Holy Spirit expand, extends a gift of prophecy to the body of Christ in general, whereas it is Christ who appoints part particular individuals to the office of the prophet. And I, I want you to understand that, 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 that comparison between 1 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians 4.11. When Christ was ascending, he released five office gifts. Apostle, prophet, pastor, evangelist, teacher. The, those were offices which he held while standing in the earth. And when he was going back to heaven, he didn't need them 
So he released them. In fact, he multiplied himself and released them to individuals. Are you hearing me? Christ gave those gifts. In 1 Corinthians 12, uh, the Holy Spirit gave it to everybody. The gifts. But when it comes to the office, and I really want, want you to follow me, because a lot of people who think that because they have the gift of prophecy in church and they're bringing forth accurate prophecies, they are prophets in the church. Unless your leader has acknowledged you as such, you are just operating in the gift of prophecy. I really want you to understand that, yes, order is the main thing here. Because listen to me, one, one devil running after you say, cut out! And one person coming and testifying that the whole family changed because you prophesied it does not make you a prophet. Look at this. The gift of prophecy is a body ministry function. While the office of the prophet is part of the fivefold leadership structure which Christ has built into his church for direction and oversight of his people. Let me, let me move in a, a little further. Look at this one. One who stands in the office of the prophet is designed and endowed to function in a higher realm of ministry and to exercise a greater level of authority than one who has the gift of prophecy. Let's continue. The office of the prophet is authorized and anointed to do much more than build up the church and encourage the church and comfort the church. And, and continue. The prophet has administrative authority and responsibility, and yeah. there is the distinction. If you don't have the, the power or the authority to implement change, even based on the prophecy you got, you are not yet a prophet. A prophet has authority to institute change. You with the gift of prophecy cannot get up in the church and say, oh, pastor, quenching the spirit because so long you tell him what God say and he's not doing it. Do you know when you give a prophecy, the leader has the right to accept or reject? All right, let me come off the platform, sir. Yes. Do you know that you cannot force your leader to accept your word? Yes. Because may I tell you, the ultimate responsibility for the direction of the church is upon your leader. Yes. If your leader shifts and dances to every prophetic tune that you play, then you are the leader and he's the follower. And if the leader is following the followers, then we ain't going anywhere because the followers don't have the vision. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Lord, I just uh, disappointed a lot of people there. <laughs> Do you know that you could even have a greater grace of the prophetic, more accurate than your pastor, yet you don't have the right to control your pastor? The prophetic word because that becomes manipulation which is the essence of witchcraft yes. and a lot of people have taken the prophetic anointing that came to them pure and clean and, and, and in, the, in the full school of the prophets the first lesson we do is called the nature of prophecy where we say it begins 100% pure in the mind of God but by the time it comes out of the mouth of the prophet, if inside, or the person who is prophesying, if inside this mind it has not been configured in such a way as to be a blessing to people, what began pure can become a whip that beats people. You see, and that is why a lot of people don't want to deal with the prophecy at, with prophecy at all. Because a lot of charlatans, as they call them, a lot of imposters, came with prophetic anointing. And if you have a prophetic anointing, but your character is not under management, the prophetic anointing can become contaminated and can contaminate the entire atmosphere in a church. So I'm telling you straight up, you cannot force your leader to implement anything at all in the prophecy that you gave. You see, you see, we also will teach you this, that a, a, a person who has a prophetic gift is really God's postman. You know, if you go home, like, like you go to work Monday and you come home Monday evening, and you see the postman, 
lean up on your post box. You know, some of us never see our postman. But you see him lean up on the post box. And you ask him, so, so what are you doing? Well, I'm the postman. And I just delivered T and Tech, TSTT, cable, quartz, um, um, wasa, and a, a whole other set of other bills. And you know what? I decided I'm staying up here tonight to make sure you pay that in the morning. You know what you're going to do? Right there and then you pull your cell phone. 999. No, no, no. The problem is they won't have any car anyway. So they may not come. But, mm, but that's all right. You'll catch up next time. Mm. But it means that that person who is postman is operating beyond his responsibility. Or as they say now in the, in the big language in politics, beyond his remit. just the postman to deliver the message. Well, may I tell you, if you are not in administration, even if your prophecy is loaded with instructions, it's beyond your remit to try to make your leader submit and commit to what you just said. Are you here? I'm trying to save you and save a whole ministry. Because I've seen ministries split because people feel it more anointed than their leader. Yes. <laughs> let's, let's look again. The prophet has the same authority to minister to the church with his preaching and prophesying as the pastor does with his teaching and counseling. Now, remember I just said that you do not have to have five people standing here to say prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist, and so on. No one person can stand. In fact, you need to have all those gifts operating in your leader. Your leader. Your leader. Your home leader. Your leader. He must be a prophet, he must be an apostle, he must have a, a teaching ability, he must be able to evangelize because he can't release you to evangelize if that spirit is not upon him. And he can't get you to prophesy if he's not exhibiting it himself. Because the human being learns by way of conditioning. He looks at an example and he patterns himself over that. Are you, are you hearing me? Good. Let, let's, prophets in church today function in, the, in all the ministries of the Old Testament that the Old Testament prophet did. They also stand in the role of Christ, the prophet, according to the New Testament. Do you know, do you know one of the things about the prophets in the Old Testament is that they were also apostles? It's just that the Hebrew didn't have a word for apostle. It's the Greek who came up with the word, with the word apostle, which means ambassador, one sent by and backed up by. But as far as God was concerned, the Ezekiel and Daniel and all of those guys, they were his ambassadors. Because what does an ambassador? An ambassador is a representation, not just a representative. He's supposed to be a representation. When you look at him, you're supposed to see Trinidad in operation. Trinidad and Tobago. The Trinidad and Tobago diplomat or ambassador in England, he's supposed to be the epitome of what Trinidad is. But then if, 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 oh Jesus, if the church is God's embassy in the earth, because may I tell you, Eden was heaven's embassy. May I tell you, an embassy that's in another nation does not depend on the nation's economy to survive and operate. It gets stuff from back home. Eh? Is anybody listening to me? And even the people who are not citizens of the, embassy, of, of, of the country that the embassy's embassy represents, but you work there, you are part of the team there. Do you know that you're going to get your payment, not from Trinidad economy, but from... Well, then, hey, tell anybody, I just got a prophetic download right there. I am God's ambassador in the earth. I don't have to worry about the economy. It could go up. It could go down. I don't have to worry about what's going on because I get my supplies from. Point and tell them where I get it. I get my supplies from. <laughs> Woo, Jesus. Look at this. The prophecies, the prophecies, that's, that, that's the office of the prophet, flow in the direction of guidance, 
instructions, rebuke, judgment, and revelation. And that is why, I'm, can I tell you this? If you are loaded with the gift of prophecy, and you really, people regard you as having a sound word in your mouth, do I, may I tell you this? You would be better advised to leave the rebuking of the congregation to your pastor. Even if he's not as prophetic as you. Because people will more readily accept a rebuke from their leader. Than from you. Who even carry such great prophetic words. They will readily accept that they, you're gonna get, they're going to get two Mercedes and a BMW. Than, to tell, than, if, than when they tell you that God said, that lying tongue that you have, you go, pong it. Because, you see, I want you to understand this. Rebuke is a very sensitive thing. And people would rather hear their leader rebuke them. But you don't hear from God, but then what you're doing following him. Hear this. Prophets are not the same as pastors speaking with the gift of prophecy. Prophets are the eyes, ears, mouth of the body of Christ, giving, giving divine guidance, whereas pastors guard the church like a shepherd guards his sheep. But a pastor must also be a prophet. And a prophet must also pastor. When you're talking about the five levels. And when I say pastor here, it doesn't mean that he is the, the de facto leader of the church. The fact is that he is part of that administration that makes decisions to move the church forward. If you're not there yet, prophesy yes, but stop frustrating yourself, God, and your leader. Amen. Trying to make people do what you say. All right. The next one. Pro uh, boom, boom. The office of the prophet. Prophets are especially anointed to perceive what is next on God's agenda. That's why when we didn't have the prophetic uh, functioning in the body of Christ like it is now, the church was going wrong in circles. I, I told you I grew up in church. And listen to me, we used to live upstairs of the church in Curep uh, uh, in the early days. And when they used to have district leaders meetings and sometimes conference in the church where my father was downstairs, we used to be appalled peeping through the window. Here in some of the pastors we respect getting known like that in the conference. We couldn't believe these brothers, oh my God. <laughs> And every conference, should women be wearing hats? Should they have on a cover over their head? Oh, Lord, three conferences ago, that was six years ago. All they discussed that. All they still discussing that. And times have changed because people now come to understand that the, that the covering of the head is not a hat. It's about here. Because in the days when Paul wrote that, women were coming in the church, crossing the street from Diana's temple, where the pro female prostitute was bald-headed and the male prostitute was growing hair. Oh yes, so when they got saved and they came across the street into the, into the, 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 the church, the prophetic gift that was on them over there was, was turned over into purity. But, and as they began to prophesy, people began to question, are they yet saved? Look, her hair not going back as yet. So Paul said, until your hair go back. Cover it with a hat or something, a turban, something. And he said, all the young men who come in church with their hair long down by the boom he said, cut it. Because that's a sign of homosexual tendencies from Overso. Because in Diana's temple, they demonstrated worship. That part of worship called koinonia. They actually had sexual orgies on the stage when the anointing hit. The anointing. When worship reached critical mass, they said, this is how we do it. And the, the prostitutes actually demonstrated it. Paul said, when you come over on this side, hello, it's a different world. Cut the hair, grow the hair. Because later on he says, the hair is the covering of the woman. 
Because they keep asking people, if, if, if you have to wear a hat my, before you pray, now you're going by the beach tomorrow, and you're going Maracas, and a big wave take you, and you're going down for the second time, and then you're going to know you want to go down three times, you're dead. Are you going to run out, get your hat, go back in, start a drunk, and ask God? And that is the one prayer of all the prayers that you pray must be answered immediately. So the moral of the story is when you're going to bed, put your hat on for me, please. Uh, prophets are God's trumpets through which he sounds the alarm to alert the church and get it ready for the change of season. May I tell you, every journey has seasons or segments or legs of the journey. And you have to know which leg of the journey you are coming out of and getting into. Those who live off the highway, or off the main road, when you leave your home up the hill, you are in one leg of the journey. Your driving is of a certain nature. When you get onto the main road, you have to know that you're not on your track up by you. You are now on the main road with more road users than you. Big truck. Container trucks. You cannot be driving with one hand like that, like you the bus. No, no, you have to be very careful. And then if you if you're driving now, it includes the highway. Highway driving is different from main road driving. But you're going to the same place. But you have to know there are segments. May I tell you, your journey to destiny, your journey to purpose, your journey to the vision being fulfilled is made up of segments over time. Each segment over time is called what? A season. To know the season that you are in is to maximize the benefits of that season. Because every season has benefits for the road user. Are you hearing me? But you must know what to take into the next season and what not to. Do you know in a relay, the only thing that makes it right through the race is the battle? As fast as using Bolt is, if he starts off the relay, when he comes to the end of the first segment, he has to stop. If he steps over the line, the whole team is disqualified. And that is why prophets are so important to the church. We have to know what season we are in. And a prophet could tell you, this is the season. And, uh, and he says, okay, now we are moving into a new season. And may I also tell you this, that a season is not confined to 365 days. I, 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 we used to make the same mistake too. We said, this is the year of this and the year of that and the year of the other. And within three months, God switched on us and we're still in the year of this. And you miss your season. It's, it's safer to say we are in a season of so and so. Because 365 days is not God's way of measuring the year. May I tell you, in God's, in God's year, God's calendar, there are 13 months and not 12. I may I tell you, the, uh, the beginning of God's year is not January the 1st. May I tell you, it's the beginning of April. Because it's according to the Jewish calendar. Because a year cannot begin with death. Winter is death. January is winter. A year is supposed to begin with life. It's called spring. But that's an external message. No, but, but, but seriously speaking, I'm telling you, that's where prophets come into the church. When we reject the prophets, we're going to be in trouble. And we're going to finish with this. Prophets are God's gift to the church. Now, the spirit of prophecy, wow, this one is powerful. Uh, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. You go read Revelation chapter 19, 10. Is the testimony of? Is the testimony of what? Is the evidence that Jesus is in the church. Is evidence that what? Jesus. If Jesus is in his church, then there has to be prophecies. You cannot claim to be a church of Jesus and not just that you don't have prophecies, but you are actually denying the role of the prophetic pronouncement. Because Jesus is about prophecy. 
The testimony of Jesus. Testimony means evidence. Because one of the awesomeness, uh, 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 awesome outcomes of a prophetic word is that healings, deliverances, and all of that come. And Jesus is known for healing and deliverance. And that's why if a worship team must be prophetic. The keyboardist must be prophetic. Listen to me. Uh, 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 um, I, uh, when, I, when I didn't even know what prophetic was, I used to be playing keyboard for my, for my father in his church. And people, as long afterwards, people come and tell me, they used to be healed when I started to play that, that, that Hammond organ. They, they used to come in sick. And as I began to play, they will feel their healing and it will be verified when I go back to the doctor. I didn't even know that was happening. Because why? Because when you are prophetic, God will use anything to bring healing to people. That book I, write, I wrote there, uh, Forgiveness Unlimited, God told me when I was writing it, he said, keep praying over it. Because when people read it, wherever in the world, they are going to get up and run to the toilet and vomit. I've gotten so many emails from people who have read the book and my writing became prophetic. Music, that is why, that is why the Jamaicans are so powerful. They control the music world in the Caribbean. They have dis discovered a beat that appeals to the human psyche deep inside. Listen to me. You realize the soca and all that, nobody takes it on except for carnival. Because, because it's the stupidness anyway. Raga, 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 go to the left, go to the right, go back, go to wine on a car, wine on a dog, wine on the ground, wine in the air. Ah. After carnival over, who whining on a dog? <laughs> whining on a car. Do you know Bob Marley died 36 years ago? And he's making more money now than he made then. Because the reggae beat, the call it is a, is a one drop beat. It, it, can I tell you that the reggae beat actually work with your heart? And that's why so many people get caught in reggae. I, I, I was in China on my way to Australia, and I'm going through the, the customs, not the customs, the, um, we call it now, the immigration. And the, boy, the guy sees my passport, and he's looking at it. He said, Trinidad and Tobago, Trinidad and Tobago. Where is that? And I'm trying to explain to him just outside Venezuela, and he couldn't answer, couldn't understand it. And the, the, the um, apostle who was with, he just goes up to him and say, Who the cap fit? I hear the fella, let them wear it. He said, Okay, Jamaica, Jamaica. I say, Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Quite in China. Anybody in China whining on a dog, whining on a cat? <laughs> so I'm telling you, when you hear the prophetic hits at church, everything becomes prophetic. In fact, we tell ushers, you are not just holding a space there. You, do you know an usher meets people long before pastor meets that person? And do you know an usher is supposed to be so sensitive to the spirit as to know who is coming in with a witching spirit? to alert the intercessors to surround that person. So you don't just run and pull the lady and say, hey, hey, um, uh, um, the usher didn't come. You could come and stand by door. No, no, no. That is a sentinel position. That is a security position. Oh, Jesus. And that's why you need to be prophetic. You need to sense people coming up that step. You see their spirit. Oh, 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 oh. Mm -hmm. All right, good. This is not a gift or office, but an anointing arising from Christ within the believer. It manifests on occasions when there is a special release of the anointing in a service or when Christians exercise their faith to be a voice through which Christ can testify. Listen to me. When, that's why you need to come in time for worship. 
when you are in the presence of worshipers who know how to get onto God's frequency, anything could happen. We've seen people get healed of cancer, of all types of diseases, and nobody touched them. But there's a point in the worship and, and level two of the, of, of, of the, the, the school of the prophets, uh, we started off with module one, which is apostolic prophetic worship, and God showed me something called critical mass. When the worship reaches critical mass, and the anointing shows up as a cloud. Remember last night? When that cloud hits the church, we have seen our own worship leaders. We can't even find them. They're on the ground. That's when you don't even have to make an altar call. People running up to the altar, lying down. People are falling between chairs and getting their healing. Because why? When you reach critical mass, Hebrews chapter 2, Two verse 13 say Jesus begins to sing with the congregation. Yes. Zephaniah chapter 3 17 says, The Lord thy God in the midst of thee, he is mighty. He begins to do cartwheels over you with what? With singing. He himself opens his mouth. That's when the lead, the worship leader becomes a lead worshiper. You begin to lead us into a place where we have not been before. Oh, And now I'm telling you, that's why the prophetic is so powerful. Get a lead worshiper, get a worship leader who knows how to hook up to God's mind and I'm telling you there'll be healing and deliverance by the time the preacher comes to preach he just has to do mopping up operations hey you feel that hey somebody lift your hand and give God a piece of praise hey, and that's when the spirit of prophecy is in the house because it's testimony of Jesus. What the scripture says, wherever he went, he was doing good. He was working miracles, signs, wonders. How? When the worship rises up, Jesus rises full stature in the church. Hekashana. And he says, who is sick among you? Who is there among you that need a miracle? Who is there among you that needs something to break? He said, just keep on worshiping me because I'll cause all heaven to come and bear. That's the time the scripture says, thy kingdom come thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven eh? because the church is heaven's embassy it is a representation of heaven therefore when john was storing heaven he said nobody was crying nobody was sick ain't got no devils they ain't got no diseases there that's why the church is supposed to be a healing station Uh, for a little while, I forget I was teaching. <laughs> Jesus. Those who are not prophets or are not aware that they have the gift of prophecy will normally not prophesy. However, when the spirit of prophecy is present, they may prophesy. Uh, we're not going into all. This often happens when they're under three conditions. When there is an awesome prophetic presence, at this time, it is easy to prophesy. Easier to prophesy than to keep silent. Uh, when we do the School of the Prophets in the smallness, uh, there's a point where I come with a microphone when the worship begins. We get the worship leaders to start a worship. And I come with a microphone and I say, trust God. Prophesy to the church. And some people at first, they say, <laughs> But because, because like, like, like the second one, uh, the second one there, when people come, among a company of prophets, like Paul, like Saul, you can't be among a company of prophets and not prophesy. Uh, and then, of course, when 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 a leader, uh, 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 Saul made a company of prophets, and they ask, they actually ask the question: Is Saul among the prophets? And remember what happened with, with Moses and the elders. Uh, God told Moses, "Bring bring those seventy chosen ones, bring them before me, and bring them into the into into, into the tabernacle." And and the same spirit that's on you, the flame on you, I'm going to split it into seventy parts and release it. And what happened? The scripture says, "When when the anointing came down, God split it, and upon every one of the seventy there was a flame of fire, and they did prophesy. Two of them couldn't make it. You know, the anointing left 
the tabernacle went down the road telling neighbor God know where you're living boy he went down the road and jumped on them two fellas and they started to prophesy inside the tent here uh, here, here Joshua he runs up to, to Moses and uh, Pastor Moses Pastor Moses they remember two of the guys who you, you sent out the invitation to they didn't come well they prophesying in the tents and, and the rule is that you can't prophesy anywhere else but inside the tabernacle here, here Moses are you jealous of me boy you jealous of me boy he said, I wish everybody in, in, in Israel could have prophesied. Let's work for me. I don't want to ask God for all you. All I hear from God for yourself. So I, I wish the whole church could prophesy. I lift your right hand up. I prophesy you will prophesy. I lift your right hand. I prophesy by God's authority. You will begin to prophesy to such a level, uh, such a level of maturity that many of the things that man of God, woman of God had to go and ask God for concerning you, you will hear it for yourself. And when they speak, it will just be confirmation. I prophesy the house will be filled with amens. The house will be filled of so be it. The house will be filled with people running up and dropping money by the, the feet of your leader because that person is confirming what God told you. I prophesy by God's authority. This is going to be a house of prophets. It's going to be a house of prophesying people. The worship will be prophetic. The intercession will be prophetic. The ushers going to be prophetic. The preachers going to be prophetic. And I prophesy every branch connected to this, wherever there's going to be a prophetic stream of God's grace, there's going to be such a healing anointing. My God, wherever you are, wherever you are, there's going to be a prophetic flow. The atmosphere is going to be prophetic. When you sit in the seat, it's going to be prophetic. My God, the sermon's going to be prophetic in the name of Jesus. Even an announcement is going to be prophetic because the house of God is going to be a testimony of Jesus. The spirit of prophecy shall operate in this house. The gift of prophecy is already in you because Holy Spirit is the gift of prophecy. And I prophesy even as you mature in the gifts, man of God, woman of God will recognize you and have you as a house prophet. Sharabondo roboko shanda rabasa. Sheteroboko satarabaka shanda. Arabando rabasha tarabako to. Mesekete be shatarebo. Rubakata yeraba shondo robo. Ah, my God. Your tongues will be prophetic, my God. Hallelujah. When you read the Bible, it's going to be prophetic. Hey, Yamasata. The word of God will speak to you, will come out to you. Ah, my shataraba. When you lift your hands, yeah, my God, your hands will be prophetic. People are going to talk about seeing streaks of fire as they lift your hand. Hey, bo shada. Even as you open your mouth, people are going to talk about actually feeling like a tsunami hit them. I prophesy, I say, I prophesy that in this house, the word of God will come to you with apostolic prophetic authority. I prophesy that the word of God will be like a hammer smashing everything that comes up against you. I prophesy when you go to the job, the prophetic mantle that comes upon you in the church will come upon you to bear in your job. People will be messing with your position, trying to stop you from your promotion. I prophesy that the grace of God on you will be so strong like a bulldozer. You will bulldoze that office and they're going to know don't mess with God's people because there is a fresh fire. Hallelujah. I say hallelujah. I say I prophesy there is a grace there is a grace in this house there is a grace in this house there is a grace in this house my God plug into the grace in this house